Okay, uh, it's uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning for Peter McCabe and myself. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome back Flight Sergeant Peter McCabe for his second uh, session on his time. Peter's going to be talking a lot about helicopters and his time in 7th Squadron. And so, Peter, without further introduction or ado from me, because most guys have watched your first mm -hmm. interview, I'm going to uh, hand over to you. Okay, Don. Um, yeah, the one of the first things I want to point out the um, uh, the aspect of servicing the um, Alouette. I don't know if um, uh, the guys observed, but you you you, you never saw uh, take on Seven Squadron idle. He was always doing something, cleaning, servicing. Um, the actual um, helicopter, the Alouette Three Rotor Head, was a very busy unit. Um, each blade was um, in, independently articulated, so the whole head was could move um, in many different directions. Each blade could flap up and down um, independently, and um, if the blade came low enough, it could take the top of the um, of the perspex uh, uh, canopy off, or it could sever the tail boom because they had that range of motion. Um, the blades could also speed up and slow down as they went around, because as the blades sort of came past the front of the aircraft. And you were going forward, it would uh, um, go with the uh, airflow and would speed up. And when it came around the back and met the airflow, it would slow down. And also the actual pitch of the blades were changed. So all of these units had bearings, and all these bearings had to be greased. And um, as much grease as you shoved in that thing, which you had to do every five hours, um, it would just throw it out again. It would spit it all over the place, uh, all over the head. So the head was always dirty. And irrespective of what you did, it would throw the grease down the blades and you have to clean the blades because the blades had to be clean to be um, efficient. Because if they, they were dirty, they wouldn't give you as much lift. And the only thing that kept that whole head in check as it was going around were the, uh, the cables, three cables that uh, connected all the blades together. And, 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 and they sort of um, kept them in control. So, so it didn't get out of whack, basically. Uh, the blades, when they were made in, in the factory, they were flown in a tank individually. And when the blade was actually neutral in, in, in the tank, the incidence was uh, recorded. And that um, angle of incidence was actually written on the blade for its life because um, that's the amount of um, pitch would require to fly neutral. Uh, so they uh, would find three blades that were roughly the same. They would then um, balance the blades. And they achieved this um, as a, um, a, a dynamic balance and, and a static balance by um, uh, putting um, uh, balance weights um, on, um, on bolts in, in, in the tips of the actual blades themselves, which were hidden by the, um, the, the orange uh, the cover over, over the tip of the blade. And um, the, um, I, I had the unfortunate uh, pleasure of meeting these balance weights personally. I was on the first time I got called up after I left in uh, in um, seventy seven. Um, I was flying with Ian Harvey out of Grand Reef, and um, um, yeah, we were um, operating uh, up by Birchnock Bridge, and we had a punch up on the side of the road, and it was all all sorted out. And um, we, uh, uh, Ian Harvey and myself, had landed because they actually sent out a road train from uh, Grand Reef if we were sort of operating in that area, which would be two trucks basically full of drums of fuel and ammunition and, and spares and, and what have you. So um, it would save you having to go all the way back to a base to refuel. And we'd met the road train and we'd refueled um, at the Melceta Junction turnoff. And we'd landed on the road and um, all the other uh, G cars were out there and they were um, uh, fetching bodies, parachutes, um, sticks and bringing them back to the road. And um, I was waiting on the side of the road uh, as the helicopters landed and Luigi Mantovani was actually flying with Frankie Robinson and they uh, landed on the road and um, they were taxiing towards where the drums were on the side of the road and um, he hit the road sign with his blade tips and I happened to be um, standing in the wrong place and um, fortunately the thing that saved me was I had my, my flak jacket on and all this, uh, the, the cement from the road sign, because the road sign's made out of concrete. Um, that actually hit me in the chest and knocked me over. And then all the balance weights went into my feet and my ankles and my legs. And I uh, was lying in a, in a crumpled heap on the side of the road. And one of the things I really remember is uh, Frankie Robinson's eyes. You know, they were just like a pookie, I'll tell you that, because he could see what was happening. And um, I wound up, uh, uh, Ian Harves had to um, fly me back to, uh, I'm totally in the cake on. 
uh, because the, the balance weights had also um, messed up the aircraft behind him. And um, so you know, Hoss flew me back to um, um, Dali Hospital and I was operating on that night and I woke up in the morning in the ward and it was uh, full of servicemen. There was um, uh, a BSA policeman who'd um, got his uh, rear end full of, of, of buckshot because uh, earlier on in the week we were operating out of, we had a contact around the Yang area and uh, some of the opposition were hiding in a cave. So they decided that what we'll do is we'll send in a police hound mechanic with his dog. And he had an Ascari behind him with a, um, a shotgun for, for protection. And the opposition inside the, the, uh, the cave didn't like this at all. So they opened fire and the, uh, the, the, the Ascari, he opened up with his, uh, his shotgun. And uh, this policeman was standing his way. So he got a rear end full of buckshot. So he wasn't very happy. And there were three RLA um, troopies. In, in the hospital as well, and that was Blondie Leatham and his mob. And um, I'd shot them two days before with the KCO. Um, they, um, we had a, um, another punch up by Birchinop Bridge, and um, this was we were testing this bunch of uh, opposition up a tree line, and uh, it was very hard to, to get a good shot at them because they were um, un undercover basically. So the oh, 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 a Blondie Leatham's um, stick was dropped and told to remain in stop. And the word is remain in stop. So um, these uh, opposition ran in, into uh, Blondie's stop group. They opened fire and uh, some of them ran out again. And um, Ian Harvey said, he said, as soon as you see them, drop them. So these guys came running out and I dropped them. I dropped a whole bunch of them. But unfortunately, Blondie and his lads decided to run after them. So I dropped all of them. Um, I think there were about... Um, um, eight um, casualties in total, but the three of them are RLI. And that's when you hear this awful word over the uh, radio, this stop, stop, stop. And um, so that, that's how we accounted for them. But uh, uh, fortunately, they um, all survived, all the RLI tribute. Uh, Blondie's hand was messed up. Um, he had to wear a brace the rest of his life. But um, it's, it's one of the things that I can point out here is that uh, the fact that um, even though you had um, control of the gun, you always had to fire at the direction of either the pilot or the KCO commander. You couldn't pull uh, the trigger uh, without them advising you or, or saying yes or no. So um, they were all in this uh, hospital ward in Amtali. And um, Ian Harvey, he'd, he'd been to the FAF and they organised a little fridge. And um, in that fridge was full of little brown bottles, which was was, was very nice. And the um, when the... Um, caterers used to come from Grand Reef every day to do their their shopping. Um, they would go through and um, and, and flood the fridge. You know, so, so it, it was one of the pluses. You know. And um, so that was uh, the balance weight story. There's some photographs in those notes I sent you of the actual sign itself and the aircraft. I, I don't know if you've seen it. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it was a hell of a mess. The aircraft was a write off. In fact, they actually wrote the aircraft off. The, the actual blades them themselves. If you had to change a blade it was um <coughs> the, the blades were had serial numbers but they also had a, had a color painted on them you had red yellow and blue blades the red blade was the master blade and um uh, when you um set the blades up we had to change the blades uh, the blades had to be um set up as per the angle and and you could change the angles by um uh, by changing uh, the pitch change rods which um had um adjusting bolts on um so you could actually change their length and one flat on the hex was equivalent to uh, six, six minutes of a degree of, of angle. So um, if, if you had to, you could do a hell of a rough um, uh, change in the bush, do the adjustment. And um, one of the easiest ways to, to track the blades is on the, on the actual tip itself, there was a blister and um, you could use a, um, a red, yellow, and blue um, wax uh, pencil and you would um, draw a stripe on each one, and you'd have a piece of cardboard on a broomstick or a stick, whatever, and, and you'd actually load the aircraft up to full, all up weight, and the pilot would then wind up the blades and pull the collective up. And you'd actually feed this piece of cardboard into the rotating um, blade disc, and the blades would actually make a mark on the cardboard, so you could see where the red, um, yellow, and, and blue lines were, and you could um, adjust them to bring them into sync. And um, I've seen, it's just many guys got overzealous with the cardboard and fed the whole thing into the blade. So you know, this normally is another mess thing. 
This is one of the other things with the blades. Um, if, if, if you got a, a hit through the blade, um, if it was in the, um, in, in the, in the fleshy part of the blade, um, the, the, uh, the blade was made up of, um, an aluminum spar on the leading edge. And then they wrapped the aluminum over the, the spar and riveted down the back. And then the inside was filled with, um, a, an epoxy foam. So, um, as if, if it went through the, uh, the foam part, all you basically did was put a piece of blade tape, um, over the actual hole and you, you panel beat the hole, but you'd have to put the piece of, of, of blade tape on all three blades to balance it out. And, um, uh, I don't know if you heard the odd helicopter, you'd hear the odd uh, whistle coming from the blades because that uh, blade tape was actually put over the leading edge to protect it from sand erosion. And some of the places we used to land in, um, there's, there's uh, mealy cobs and trees and dust and stones and um, they'd wear the blades down, but they'd also um, hit into this tape and they would make little holes in and they would form a, a blister as it went around and these would whistle. You know, it was very annoying, but it was also another one of those things that you had to service. You know? And um, uh, I was on, on, on call up um, oh, 78, I think it was, with um, uh, Wing Commander Mark Smithdorf. And we were um, making up numbers on a fire force at Pretenga. And um, Mark came down to me one day and he said, um, I, I need you to take your um, your toolbox and your flying kit and come with me. So I said, fine. So I, I did that and all the rest of the fire force was there. And this islander landed. And um, the the pilot motioned for us to you know, hop in. So I hopped in and, they, and there was only one seat in this islander, which the, the pilot was sitting in. And they'd managed to sh uh, shoehorn three LOA three blades into this islander just. So Mark and myself, we made ourselves um, uncomfortable in the back of the aircraft. And away he went. And we proceeded to head sort of southeast. And um, we flew over the uh, Limpopo and we kept on flying. And we eventually landed in a, a bush runway. And there was an LOA three there from the South African Air Force, LOA three. And we were at um, a, a recce commando camp in, uh, uh, as I say, even, even this day, I don't know where the hell it was, but it uh, turns out that earlier on that morning, the two other threes from the South African Air Force were taking the uh, two sticks of Ricky Commander out to, to do whatever they did. And they landed on the side of the hill and um, the stick leader of the, uh, of, of the second Alouette, as he left the aircraft, he ran straight up the hill and he ran straight into the blades and um, it didn't do him any good. It, plus the uh, fact that he had a Bergen on um, it really messed up the blades. So the, all the pilot could do was just dump power and, and switch off and left it. So they got into the other LOA 3 and they flew back. So our job was to go out there and change the blades. So we yeah. put the three blades in this LOA 3 that was there, landed on the side of the hill, pulled these blades out, and Mark and myself went to um, change the blades. But um, the opposition uh, that these guys were against, they, they wanted this aircraft as a trophy. And, and there was a, a hell of a punch-up going on. And um, there's this um, one stupid technician who climbed right up onto the top of this helicopter, exposing himself to all and sundry and was taking an awful amount of fire. That took a lot of interest in me. They wanted to stop me whatever I was doing. So Mark and myself managed to change the blades. And um, I, I, I did the, uh, the rough feel adjustment to settle it in for the new blades. And um, we worked out that it all set to go. I, I checked the rest of the aircraft, everything seemed right. So fortunately, this, um, uh, the, the stick leader had been put into his sleeping bag and it was zipped up. So we put him in the back of the aircraft and um, called the, uh, the stick leader or the guy who was in charge. And I said, we're going to do it, a quick test run. If it's okay, the three of you hop in and the other aircraft is right behind us. So we pick the other four up and away we went. So um, we've uh, Mark fired it up and it, it felt all right. And uh, the other three guys loaded in. We zoomed off and I let rip in the bush with the browning. And the other aircraft landed and, and we went back, but we went back to Hoodspray, and which was a fairly big base right on the uh, northern border. And we landed there and um, an ambulance came and fetched this guy. The, the truck came and fetched all the other guys. And there we were, uh, Mark and myself sitting there. So we waited for the islander to come back, took the blades off, put them back in the island and went back to Ratinga. It's it one of those interesting uh, side lines. Eh? Sure. And... Uh, so was and, the guy uh, was the, was the guy killed by the he, he was a oh, he, he, he was seriously dead man sure you know, yeah as I said as he ran up the hill he ran straight into the blades 
So he had no chance. And because um, those blades make a hell of a mess of anything that they yeah. they strike. And the um, the, the tail rotor itself that turns at uh, two two and a half thousand RPM, and um, it uh, holds your torque basically. I was uh, in the early days, I was flying either with Todd Litson or Steve Caldwell. And we were operating out at, uh, of Darwin before the fire force thing. And um, as, as we landed um, and threw the trips out, um, two of the opposition stood up about 30 meters away and started shooting at the pilot. And uh, he took exception to this and uh, just pulled up on the, uh, on the stick, basically, and turned the aircraft to get away from him. So to, and also, in theory, to bring the gun to bear. But he put the tail rotor straight through a tree. And uh, he went up like a whirling dervish. I tell you, that chopper went straight up and round and round at the same time. And he finally managed to stabilize it at about 2,000 feet and get it flying the right direction. And um, I, I had a look out the back and uh, at, at the tail rotor, and there the, the, the weren't the right number of red and, and, and yellow stripes going round and round. So we'd taken off about half the tail rotor. So he effectively had no tail rotor control. And um, the only thing we could do there was an internal affairs um, keep not too far away. So we managed to do a roller landing on the runway there and um, had a look at the blades. And they, they, so there were only half of each one left. And um, so we managed there. And the, um, this is, we called Darwin and um, a, a police reserve airing aircraft flew us in a new set of tail rotor blades that we changed there and, and went back home. So, you know, everything was very finely balanced. Too. But um, this is one of the worst things about the Alouette 3 was the actual dirt, you know, the, the grease and the cleaning. And always, you were servicing, you always cleaning. And it was a matter of pride, you know, to, to keep your aircraft clean. And um, the uh, Air Force um, sorted you out with that. They gave you a couple of rolls of rag spanners, we called them, which is rolls of mutton cloth, you know, just for the purpose of cleaning airplanes. And um, I remember we were operating on uh, Darwin, and Dave Boyce was flying with Dick Paxton. And um, the only um, sort of safety item we had apart from our flak jackets was um, what we called a monkey belt, which was uh, just a webbing belt with a um, half a meter piece of cable with um, a carabiner hook on the end, which we just used to hook onto wherever we, we could when we were in the aircraft. And uh, they'd landed at Darwin and um, old Dave Boyce was uh, just hopped out and was just about to undo his monkey belt. And uh, uh, Dick Paxton thought he'd do him a hell of a favor. And he lifted the aircraft up to move closer to the fuel drums because he landed about five meters away from the fuel drums. And uh, at that point, there was Dave hanging off the end of his, his monkey belt underneath this helicopter. So as you can see, he wasn't very happy about that. And he, as soon as he uh, Dick put, put the aircraft down, he went around and gave uh, Dick a piece of his mind. And um, he, he started whinging about the fact that the pilots never did anything. And um, from, th from then on, Dick would keep his side of the aircraft clean and Dave would keep his side of the aircraft clean. And uh, it's one of the strangest alouettes you've ever seen with us uh, clean one side and dirty the other. And uh, right to the end of that trip, old, old Boggy Boys, he insisted that he's only going to clean his side of the aircraft and the uh, old Dick wouldn't relent. So it, it was an interesting one. I was at, um, at, at Centenary um, when we just opened the new runway at Centenary and um, it had been retired and uh, I think it was on day one and um, all the, uh, the, the choppers were parked down the one side of the runway and, uh, and the cake I was in the lead, so it's furthest along. And I was up there doing the cleaning as per usual. And it was right on evening time and um, a, a provost aircraft with a, a pilot and an instructor, they were getting um, so sort of familiar with the bush routine. So to make up time, they were doing circuits and bumps and um, just, to, um, just to get hours for the student basically. And he really wanted to in, in, impress his, his pilot. But um, in, in the morning, they'd actually dug a trench right across the threshold of the runway to lay some water pipes down or something. So you had uh, right on the end of the runway, you had this ditch and, and, um, and, and all, the, all the spoil, the sand was, was piled up on the one side. And this uh, student was going to impress the hell out of everybody. And he was going to land on the threshold. But he actually landed a meter short and he hit this uh, mound of sand with the wheels and it just pulled the wheels off. And this um, uh, provost thumped down onto the runway and was grinding as long as and it was heading straight for my O3. And there I was on uh, up on the head, couldn't do anything. And it, it stopped about two meters from my LOA3. Uh, and um, it's the fastest I've ever seen a pilot and a student get out of an aircraft and run because they just because um, they didn't have to get down from the wings because it was a ground level. So um, uh, 
that was an interesting one. There's actually a photograph of the um, of the aircraft in, in the Pride of Eagles. You can see the Provost lying on the ground. It was it was very interesting, you know. So, and um, so uh, it's, it's just one of those very fast underpants changes. You know, it was just very close and also very loud. One of the um, uh, fire force operations we went on, I, I can remember. I forget who I was flying with, and um, they didn't have radio altimeters in in the Dakota. And um, the, uh, um, the the pilot would basically um, uh, land um, uh, a helicopter pilot would land on the um, in, in in the DZ and um, work out the altitude and the um, he would relay that information to the DC three pilot and he would adjust his altimeter but um, so something went wrong and um, they landed these um, uh, sixteen troopies out, out of the deck and almost at once there were sixteen blue smokes because this thing went in at 180 feet and uh, all the guys were injured. Um, I forget whether it was RLI or RAL. So um, that whole operation was just cancelled immediately and um, flying everybody back to the hospital. Yeah? And um, I don't know, it's just, uh, just one of those things, you know, I, I, I don't know if anybody can uh, remember or who was the victim, but um, it, it wasn't very nice. But um, the actual um, number of fire force uh, deployments have been on and you see, you see the paratroopers just go out and, and, and they're taking all sorts of fire and whatever you you, you really have to take your hat off to them. I was um, on, on call up with Dave Thorne um, out of Darwin uh, in 79, I think it was. And um, we had the RLI fire force there and we called out first thing in the morning and uh, 16 paratroops were in. Uh, the operation was wound up so we then flew them back to the closest runway that they put on parachutes and flying back to Darwin. And uh, someone had the nerve to open up on us as we were flying over. So we initiated the, the second contact of the day and um, the uh, 16 troopies went out again. So that's the, their second jump for the day. And uh, that punch up didn't last very long. So we flew them back to the same runway, put new parachutes on. And we're heading back to uh, Darwin at about four o'clock in the afternoon. Then. And um, they, they found some more business for us. So those same paratroopers went in third time in the same day. All 16 troopies out, and um, the it, it was a fairly big punch up on, on the ground. So the the KCAR commander decided he would stay with his guys. So we we dropped him off in the the G guys that had already gone back to Darwin. So um, Dave and myself were heading um, back to Darwin, and um, uh, Darwin radio called up and they said that an OP had seen a hundred plus opposition um, coming up out of a, a river line and a tree line into a thickly wooded area, isolated thickly wooded area next to Gormal. Um, would we go and have a look? And we said, well, we've we've got no troops. We've got no nothing, basically, except the KCOM. And they said, we, we just want you to go and have a look to, to, to see what it is. And um, they so said they'd send us some help. So they sent two hunters. And um, we sort of arrived in the area at the same time as these hunters did. And the opposition on the ground ob ob objected to all of us being there. So they, they started firing. Um, but it's from a, a th thickly wooded area, so, so there's not much point in wasting KCAR ammunition. So the, the, the hunters, um, we threw smoke and the hunters went in and worked out where it was and they let rip into this wooded area. So um, they, were, they were taking uh, turns at, uh, uh, with their front guns and snaps and and then um, there, there was a, a, a Canberra full of alphas that had been dispatched as well because this was getting to be pretty serious. And um, the, uh, the hunter pilots talked this Canberra pilot into where the uh, area was, and we remarked it with smoke. And we thought this is going to sort this whole lot out because it was just the right size for a um, for, for a bomb box, a uh, uh, bloated alpha. And uh, to our uh, amazement, the uh, the ground erupted about a kilometre away because the Canberra pilot got everything wrong, and so he'd um, just picked a piece of Africa and unloaded his lot. And it was nowhere near the target. So, um, and we were running out of fuel. The hunters were empty. We were empty. So we decided to go home. And um, that's what we did. We just left it as it was. And I don't think anybody ever went back to see what the results were. Yeah. It's, um, it's just how, um, how the action was hotting up in those days. You know, so it was, um, it was so very interesting. And um, it's one of the other things when I was on, on, on the same call up, basically. I was um, flying with Dave and we'd been out and normal servicing. One of the um, things they used to do with um, new pilots um, to introduce them to the fire force was to have um, 
the in, instructor fly up two student pilots um, in an Alouette three, and they would sort of hang around the edges of um, of, of, of the battlefield, and, and they would get used to the uh, watching the deployment and um, and listening to the radio chatter, and then see how everything went on, you know. And um, the the, uh, the the instructor at at this stage was good old Toffer Dickinson, and I'd flown with him lots of time before. And um, he had these two student pilots, and uh, at, at the end of the day, they were doing circuits and bumps to get their hours up on the runway. And um, uh, he'd land on the runway, and I was, I was servicing my aircraft. And uh, his, uh, his tech came running up to me. He said, uh, the Toffer wants to see you on the runway and bring your flying helmet. You know? So I thought maybe I had a radio problem that I'd be going to listen to. So I went down there, and um, as I arrived at the aircraft, um, the, uh, he told the student in the front right hand seat to get out and sit in the back and he told me to get in and fly this damn thing he said i had it for half an hour he said it's all i can give you is half an hour it's i'm sure we had and i had the greatest fun in my life flying that alloy three you know because i was up and down the runway doing turns and auto rotations and um, landed it back and parked it outside of through vetment and you should have seen the two the eyes on these student pilots they just couldn't believe this because here's this uh, big bearded man um uh, for flying the aircraft and he was a technician you know so I think there was a, a pointed lesson there, you know, <laughs> and, and everybody asked me, you know, how could I fly with a beard? And, you know, because I didn't wear rank or anything like that. And they used to say, you know, who are you with? And I used to say, oh, salute rotors, you know. But, um, uh, yeah, it was all, all very interesting. Yeah. And then um, one of the other things, uh, the um, speaking of pilots, um, this, we got a couple of uh, American pilots, ex-Vietnam, um, the first one uh, in the rank was G.I. Joe Sizzler. He was a little American guy. And um, he'd sort of hot from Vietnam. And um, what they used to do was um, for a, a new tech, basically, would fly with a seasoned pilot until he got his, his um, everything organized and he'd dashed around, worked out what was what. And um, they used to fly, um, used to send an, an old tech with new pilots um, to help them. It was, um, it was a hell of a learning curve. And uh, so I was um, sent out with Joe Sisler on his um, first few um, sorties because uh, um, in, in Vietnam, they had everything on GPS. We didn't have any GPS. We just had a map, basically. So these guys had to learn the hard way how to read maps, and we would help them out. And um, I was based at, um, at Chipinga with Joe and the Keiko uh, deploying um, troops along the border. And one of these young pilots had basically landed uh, a whole a stick on the wrong side of the border, and they were in uh, enemy territory in, in Freddy land. And um, the uh, uh, the Freddies had seen them landing, and, and they objected to this whole lot, and and, and they wanted to shoot these guys. So um, they were coming on extremely heavy fire, and they called us in, and um, we went in there, and there was a hell of a punch up going on, and there was just, there were just Freddies everywhere, and most of them got dropped, and um, just we got thirty odd strikes in the aircraft. By the time we got back to um, um, Chipinga, but uh, but we managed to get these guys out. So, um, you know, it's just one of those wrong side of the line jobs. And um, a radio intercept uh, from the Freddies later on said that uh, we dropped about forty-five of them. So they they, they weren't very happy. And then um, also I was flying with Dave Thorne in, in Chipinga as well, and um, we we had a, um, a call out for Kazvek at night. Um, there was a, a guy having heart problems, and it, I think it was a party sick. So there were four of them, and um, it was just serviceable to fly. Uh, there was um, just enough moonlight. So we went in and worked out where these guys were, using the Becker Hummer and various other things. And, um, and, 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 and Dave said, as soon as we're about to land, we want you guys to throw a white phosphorus grenade away from your area to light that up so we could see where we went in to land, isn't it? So they threw the white phosphorus, we went in and landed, and um, I helped this guy into the aircraft. And and the other three guys hopped in as well, and they reckon there's no way that they were going to stay there by themselves with their, their uh, LZ being compromised. So we had to uh, stagger out of that place, you know, and uh, oh, it was a hell of a job getting them out of there, and they flew this guy to Amtali. When we first um, operated Fire Force out of uh, Amtali, um, uh, Grand Reef wasn't ready for us. So there was there's a girls' school or a ladies teachers training school right on the border in Amtali. Um, I, I forget what it's called. So the um, RLI were actually um, were billeted 
there and, and the aircraft uh, helicopters were based there as well. We used the sports field. And um, one of the things I always remember there is um, uh, Pete Fondell, he was he was betting in his mortar. And um, first time I'd, I'd seen it, he, he used a charge nine and half a cup of petrol down the barrel to bed this thing into the uh, into the car park. <laughs> Made a hell of a bang. One of the um, the uh, uh, drills we used to do with the um, uh, military uh, mortars, you had um, uh, dedicated uh, mortar platoons. I, I think they were with the um, um, uh, service regiment. And um, what they used to do is mount the um, the 82 mil mortar in a bag, which we used to put under the step on the right hand side of, of the Alouette 3. And the four man mortar team used to get it in, and they all had waistcoats, and they put um, five mortar bombs in each waistcoat, two in the back, two in the front. And um, what the, the pilot used to do was once the target was identified, he would land in an LZ uh, with the aircraft pointing in the direction of the target. And he would indicate to the, um, the, uh, the senior guy or the, uh, the, the, the laying guy um, what the heading was and roughly how far it was on the map. And we would then take off and sneak around the back at low level. And um, by the time we'd done a full orbit and heading over the, um, the base boat uh, position, these guys had already fired um, a bedding in charge and a smoke. And by the time the smoke landed, we flew over him and uh, would give him uh, corrections on the smoke. And we'd do another orbit. By the time we got back and landed, they would have put 20 bombs in the air, the mortar back in a bag, and they would hop on and away we'd go so they wouldn't be compromised. And um, we, we did that quite a few times. It was uh, very interesting to do. And um, that uh, one of the dangerous things was their aiming stick, that red and white stick that they used to use as their reference point. That used to go under the seat and sometimes poke out the other side because it's very sharp. And, and then um, I was flying with um, out of the same place with the uh, Root and Toot and Bill McQuaid. He was another one of the Americans. And um, some brown jobs were, had rolled at 2.5 on the road from Inyanga to Mtali. And there was, uh, a lot of people were hurt, so they called for two um, Alouettes to, to come in Kazovac at night. And we were, flew from uh, the, uh, the school in Mtali over the, the mountains, and we were heading along the road to Inyanga. And um, Bill said he would go low and fly on the road just to see if we could see where these guys were, and the other aircraft would stay high. And we flew straight into cloud. And uh, the, the other aircraft, you, you couldn't see us because we were right down the bottom. And um, we flew into the um, into this cloud, couldn't see a damn thing. And uh, Bill ma managed to get this aircraft stable. And uh, one of the things we had in the aircraft was um, a, 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 um, a, a spotlight that operated from aircraft power. And it, it had a handle on it. And you could basically use this when you were going in at night to LZs. So I lay down on the floor and pointed this thing right outside as low as I could get so the, uh, the backscatter wouldn't. Um, mess up his vision and uh, as soon as I looked down I just saw three lots of wires big shiny uh, copper wires of uh, the, the, the power pole so I just called pull wires and Bull lifted the aircraft up and at, at, at that point our radio went US because um, that's all the other aircraft heard was this pull wires and uh, it went dead so they thought we'd crashed so, um, so we managed to move sideways and land on the road so um, we shut the aircraft down as we landed on the road, and um, it was a standard type road. And there we were, all cloud all around us. And um, it, uh, a truck came along the road. It was a forestry commission truck full of labourers. So we got these guys, and we managed to turn the aircraft around, and we started pushing it down the hill until we were out of the cloud. At uh, at, at, at this stage, the uh, another uh, brown job or uh, uh, two five came along with all these uh, injured guys on it. So I assessed them and, and we could only take four of the most serious wounded, broken arms and legs and what have you. So we, we stuck them in and we took off and we're heading back to Mtali. And um, we couldn't contact anyone because the radio was US. And um, since we were about, uh, um, I don't know, 30 k's from Mtali by the mountains there and we were running out of fuel. And um, on the side of the road, there was a, a, a set of lights from a farmhouse, so we decided we'd land at this uh, farmhouse, basically, and uh, we call in there. And there was a hell of a party going on at this place. All the farmers were getting together and uh, uh, their wives and, and what have you. And there we land right in the middle of this 
And um, they immediately organized some cars to take these guys the rest of the way to die to um, Tali Hospital. And, um, and, and, and there we were. Um, we'd uh, it landed. So we just joined in the party. Uh, Bill phoned through to the, to the officer room saying that we were okay. And we flew back in the morning. So that was another one of those, those Kazakh things. Oh, um, with, uh, with battle damaged aircraft, I was flying with um, um, uh, Toffer Dickinson. Again, we were at, uh, at Mount Darwin and um, that this uh, particular Alouette 3, um, it needed servicing and it was also full of bullet holes and it was, it was due a, um, a minor service or something. So it had to go back to Serum for this. So we were going to fly this aircraft back to Serum, change the aircraft over and fly back to uh, Darwin with a serviceable aircraft. And um, we were sort of over Mazoe and um, Tower called us and they said, um, could you change frequency to um, uh, to Milton Building Ops, uh, which was 1227. Uh, one, two, so we changed frequency and we spoke to the, uh, the, the guys at Milton Buildings. And then they said at Ellen Wilson High School, they were having a careers day for the, uh, the boys. And um, they had, um, the, uh, the brown jobs were there in force. They had a, a, an Eland armored car there and Unimogs and um, machine gun sets up and internal affairs were there. And, Police were there with their um, B cars and Land Rovers, and uh, the Air Force were there with uh, some models. And so they weren't doing uh, very well, and um, the Air Force were concerned that they were they were losing interest to these boys. So they um, asked us if we could just fly past and land there, so the guys could have a real exhibit to look at. Now. So there we were. I'm I'm, I'm in shorts and uh, normal short shirt and fellies, and and um, we weren't prepared for any show you know so we went and landed there and there this aircraft was the um mag bag was f full of doppies um I, I took the firing pin out and um the uh, uh the staff um from the school they, they welcomed us so um mrs Tozer, the maths teacher she recognized me and they said hello and mr pert and mr barley they all said hello and they asked us if we'd like um like a cup of tea because uh, the, the Air Force guys that were on the stand there, they immediately took over the Salawit 3 and were bragging about it. And um, so we went into the uh, into the staff room. And um, when I was at Alan Wilson, the, uh, the staff room was a no-go area. I went in there, and it wasn't too badly laid out. Those buckets actually had a fridge in there, and it was full of booze. And so they offered me a beer, so I had a beer. And, um, and, and, and Toffer was only allowed a cup of tea because he was flying. So we had that, and by the time we got back, the old, old, old doppy bag was empty. All the doppies had gone, and um, to all these schoolboys were hanging around us out with three, and the army gave up, and they went home. The police gave up, they went home. So the Air Force made a hit on that one. You know? And we flew from there back to Serum, picked up a chopper, and went back to Darwin. You know? When you were operating on, on 7 Squadron as a tech, you used to get 37 cents a day flying pay extra over and above your wage. Which was a hell of a lot of money, you know, 37 cents. Wow, you know. And um, if you flew on, they raised that to 50 cents a day. <clears throat> so yeah, um, even if you had a, a sidearm on your arm, so you always claimed arm flying pay, you know, to boost your, your money just a little bit. Uh, in, in, in the early days, um, when I was on Sims one, first off, we um, had um, the hearts and minds thing. They, uh, the troopies were patrolling through a village out of Mount Darwin and they, uh, they came across a, a crawl there, and the uh, one young African female was having problems giving birth. She had a breech birth. Um, she had breech, yeah. And um, so they, they, they called us in to fly her into the mission. So we landed there, and this, I think, is the first time this young African female had actually seen a helicopter. And we loaded her into the back of it on the, on the stretcher and fired up, and away we went. And um, she objected to this, and she wanted to get out. And at the same time, this um, breach birth problems solved itself and she gave birth in the chopper there. So I grabbed hold of this little infant, cut the cord, wrapped it in mutton cloth and put it on the pilot's lap and um, uh, try to hold this female down. But we managed to get her back to the, uh, the mission in one piece and handed the slot over. And then it's another one of those things you have to clean an awful lot of mess, you know. And um, <clears throat> one of the places I enjoyed going to was in Yanga. It was um, when the uh, ind independent company was trying to they moved in there. They had a, a beautiful uh, a new barracks set up. They had a sergeant's mess and them, at least a troopies mess and officers mess. And they actually had a, a cement uh, LZ for the chopper. 
they had in-ground fueling and uh, they had a store, a little uh, hut that we put our stuff in. And uh, on Saturday morning, I was having tea with uh, Sig Sigsworth and Jimmy May was the medic. And um, at, at that time, there was a, a one of the first hang gliders ever in Rhodesia. And this guy who decided for his first flight, he would go off World's View. Uh, he, he wasn't experienced, but he said that that's the best place to do it. So um, he, he sort of announced what time he was going to go off. And we were all deciding to smash having, having a cup of tea and watching for this guy. And we saw him launch off the edge of World's View and go straight back into the side of the hill, which is an awful long way up. So I said to Sig, you better go find Dick Paxton because I was flying with him. And uh, I got told Jim May, we'd, um, come and help me put the hoist on the aircraft and get it set for hoisting configuration. And uh, removed the gun, uh, dropped the floor, put the hoist on, got the, um, uh, the, um, the, the hoisting sling. And also we had um, four um, injured people. We had a thing called a Rogerson stretcher, which is actually a cane wraparound unit. Uh, and it was a rigid, but it was held together by straps. So you could lay the patient in the slot and do the straps up around him. And then you could hoist him from the top and he would stay in the stretcher, basically not move. So um, uh, Dick Paxton came along and we pointed out where we'd seen this thing go in. And uh, Jimmy May, myself and Dick, um, we haven't got airborne and we're flying along. There's a whole crowd of people on the top of World's View also pointing. So we eventually found this kite, which was on, on the side of the hill, at least on, on, on the side of the face of, of the Gomo. And there was nobody in it. So we then started searching around and there this body was trapped on a ledge about uh, 30 meters below the kite. So uh, I winched uh, Jimmy May down and he had a radio and landed him next to this guy. And uh, we um, said to Jimmy, how's he doing? You know? uh, is he serious? And he said, yes, he's seriously dead now. So um, I said, well, I'll twist down the, uh, uh, the Rogerson stretcher for you. And uh, twisted that down. And with great difficulty, he managed to get this guy in the stretcher and got it all, all strapped up. So he had to wait there while we hoisted this up and we flew straight back to the police station and, and, and dropped this, this um, guy off there. But uh, well, Jim May hadn't been able to do the, the straps up tight enough. And this guy was actually flowing down in the stretcher, just trying to come out of the bottom. So there I'm sitting on the floor, hanging onto the stretcher to stop him coming out the bottom. We then flew back to um, the, at the top there and told the people just to go to the police station. And, and, and they said at that time that two photographers from the Herald had actually gone down the face of the hill of at least a world's view to try and find this guy. And I said, well, that's, we haven't got enough fuel to waste uh, looking for them anyway. So we flew back and um, so, uh, Dick's flying was superb, you know, hanging right next to this rock face, not moving. And uh, uh, the tips were almost into the rocks because that's, uh, we didn't have enough um, wire on the hoist to um, go further down to make it safer. But he, he did an immaculate job of flying that day. You know? And the thing that really pissed me off was, it was the Herald um, uh, reported that it was an army helicopter uh, as opposed to Air Force. You know? so, uh, I wasn't very happy about that. Sometime in the 76, 77, they had a, a national day of prayer for Rhodesia. I, I don't know if you remember that. Um, they, um, all the churches, they had prayer meetings and, um, they, they flew a DC three, well, a couple of them uh, around the country to all, all the, um, fire forces and they were loaded with sky pilots. You know, they had reverends and chaplains and brothers and fathers and, um, rabbis, you know, they, they had the whole mix and they all landed a faff and everybody gathered around and you'd, you'd all have a prayer and then they'd move on to the next one. But, um, we were involved in a punch up out of Spenga and, um, they were waiting around for us. It was raining. It was bloody miserable. And uh, so we landed. And um, Henry Jovi was flying with uh, Mike Borlase. And um, we all landed, disgorged the troops. And uh, Henry and uh, Mike lifted off and they went away. We didn't know. We, I don't think they wanted to be in amongst the slot. But um, we were all there in the rain, heads bowed. And everybody had their say. And uh, uh, Chalky White from the commander, after all this, he was soaking wet. And, he stripped off his shirt and was running around and saying, I don't care if it rains or freezes, chalky, safe in the hands of Jesus. And he was, <laughs> was running around and these padres are most upset about this whole lot. And then Mike Bolos and Henry Jovi um, they came back in the Alouette 3 and they did a very slow fly past. And uh, Henry was sitting on the right-hand side of the aircraft 
And all um, Mike Borlase and him were wearing were top hats. And uh, had all these people around the old deck and there they were doing a casual wave, you know, as they went past. So I, 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 I think all the Padres might have just gave up on us then. So it was, uh, yeah, it was all very interesting. Yeah, and, I, I, uh, I often saw Dick Paxson wearing a top hat as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. he actually, um, this is one of the, um, uh, the tailors at the uh, shops in Darwin there. Um, they used to make us all sorts of funny hats. And, and, and Dick actually had a, a camouflage top hat made. Um, uh, uh, I forget who it was. He had a, a deer stalker made out of, out of camouflage material. So he looked like Sherlock Holmes, you know, and they had all sorts of funny hats. And one, of had the, one, of, one of those bark hats from those bark hats from Chipinga, I remember. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But one of the things that um, uh, Beaver Shaw mentioned. On Op, Op Snoopy, he took a round through one of his control rods, and I, I was called up for Op Snoopy. And um, there this aircraft was, and we were about to leave. And um, I was there with Alan Ed. He was also on call up. And um, we had a look at Beaver's um, control rod. It was one of the ones that went up behind the back wall of the aircraft. And we um, got a round right through the base of it. And um, they started going to blow the aircraft. Um, they, they didn't want to fly it. So um, Alan and myself, we, uh, I, I had a little suitcase of stuff for goodies and I had a couple of hose clips in there and I had some epoxy resin and uh, I chopped a piece of aluminium off the off the Strelis shard and uh, we um, so we did a repair on his control rod so he, he could fly back and he wouldn't waste an aircraft you know? and um, he's, there's a photograph of that in his book I think of the actual uh, control mm. rod that we repaired yes. um, it's one of the other ones um, it was uh, 74, I think it was, and um, the, uh, on, on an order or a request came through to the from uh, the squadron. Um, we were all in the crew room basically, and they said they wanted three techs, three pilots, and one um, alouette immediately. Uh, so we went out there, and they also gave us um, a petrol uh, air compressor, um, it, uh, some tins of jungle green and brown paint, a whole bunch of newspaper, and some masking tape. So we're not knowing what's going on here. So we hop in this aircraft and we head south and refuel at Vic Falls and then head even further south. And just before we came to the Papa, there's a, a, um, an, a, an LZ a clearing. And in this, uh, in this uh, LZ, there are two beautiful white and gold Alouette threes with uh, Benson and Hedges logos on them and a Jet Ranger. So we landed next to these things there and um, the pilot handed over an envelope to these guys. They got in the Jet Ranger and they left. So there we had these two beautiful white um, aircraft. Um, they'd been imported for the um, uh, the Grand Prix at, at, at Kyle Army for that year. And also they were there for the Round Easter show. They were showing the Benson Hedges flag, basically. And they wound up in Rhodesia. So there we had to mask these things off and uh, throw some green and brown paint at them so they didn't look so good. And um, uh, flew them back to New Serum. And they were done out beautifully. They had VIP seats in them, soft, comfy seats, as opposed to a piece of plank of plywood. And um, we landed, and they both went into um, ASS to be checked and serviced and what have you. And, and they were actually aircraft 18 and 19, 5718 and 5179. And um, those were the first two K cars that we had made. Uh, Peter Rawlings was in ASS. And there's a hell of a lot of work involved in making them into K cars. The, the floor in the back of the Alouette is actually made up of a honeycomb sandwich. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen honeycomb like beeswax honeycomb. And there's a sheet of aluminium on the bottom and they, they glue the honeycomb to that and then they glue a layer on the top. So it's very light, but very strong. So what they had to do was where the four mounting points are for the actual um, uh, the gun floor that mounts onto those, they had to do for, uh, for 250 millimeters circle around each one of those points. They had to drill into each of the honeycombs and fill it full of epoxy resin. And it took forever because you had to drill into each honeycomb, and fill it with epoxy, and do the same all the way around. And, and those were the first two, uh, first two gunships. And every now and then, when you'd open up a, a panel, you could still see a bit of this white and gold sticking through there. You know, it was amazing stuff. The um, uh, the Portuguese in in Mozambique they had a yellow Alouette three that was um, part of the Cabora uh, um, Bassa Power Company. They used it to inspect their lines. So every, everybody knew in Mozambique that this yellow helicopter 
was uh, don't shoot at it. Don't you? So um, it's amazing. In our smoke hangar down at, at New Serum, there we also had a yellow helicopter, and um, you know it, uh, it was Rob Blumeris's uh, baby, and it wasn't armed, but um, every now and then you'd hear this thing flying at night and the way it'd go, and, and it wouldn't be there the next morning, and um, the whole cover was blown basically when the the, the Portuguese pilot of this yellow Alouette three flew across the border and, and surrendered. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so we had this, um, our free taxi ride was over basically. And uh, this is one of the last ones and I'll let you go, but uh, landmines um, in, in, in the early days it, um, when the buses still ran in, in, in the TTLs, we were operating out of Darwin there and flying to Rishingo with the pilot. And um, as, as you could actually see a landmine going off in the distance, you could actually see the mushroom cloud of dust. Uh, and uh, my pilot, myself, we flew into this one, and it was a, a, a Matumba Nadza bus. I had actually hit it with the front right wheel, I think it was. And uh, as, as you know, those, those buses don't go anywhere empty. And there was a hell of a lot of carnage. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that you, you, you put in a, on a, on a back burner, and um, you never try and think about it again. But the amount of carnage is unreal. And um, I went in there, and I, I just started sorting out um, cases throwing them in the helicopter and just told the, uh, the pilot to fly them to Karanda and come back, you know, because there was still more to do, you know, you couldn't leave them. And, and it happened on more than one occasion. It was, um, it's, the landmines is horrible, you know, horrible bloody things, you know, don't discriminate. You know? Yeah, yeah, especially on a soft-skinned civilian vehicle. Huh? Yeah. All righty, John, I'll let you go and um, just let me know when it happens and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I think that's about it for the moment, John. I, I, I okay. hope you've got enough there to yeah, put it all no, back together. I think that's wonderful, Peter. Uh, there's some wonderful, wonderful stories and great detail. Thank you so much, brother. I'm actually sitting in um, the back of a convenience store. So yeah. <laughs> there's stuff coming past me. and I should I should actually show you. Um, let me take this mic off. Yeah. And uh, let you see where I'm sitting because there's so the only place where there's Wi-Fi in my area. At the moment. Um, but yeah, if you look, uh, you'll see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. 